In this presentation, I will talk about heteroskedasticity. The outline of this presentation will be first to uh, go over the definition of heteroskedasticity, talk about the consequences of it, then uh, discuss different heteroskedasticity tests, including the Bruce Pagan white and alternative white tests, and finally provide correction for heteroskedasticity, including robust standard errors, weighted least squares, and feasible generalized least squares. So to recap, a definition of heteroskedasticity is uh, the following. Um, for homoskedasticity, we want the variance of ui given xi1, xi2, all the way to xik to be equal to sigma square. So in other, way, in other words, we want the variance of the error term u to not differ with the independent variables. So we want stable and constant variance. Heteroskedasticity is the opposite, where the variance of u, given all the x independent variables, does not equal sigma squared, or it's not constant. So in this case, the variance of the error term differs with the independent variables. So what are the consequences of heteroskedasticity? So uh, the good consequences are the OLS estimators are still unbiased and consistent because uh, if we assume the first four uh, Gauss-Markov assumptions to still uh, be valid, uh, and the R squared is still valid, so these are, so th these things still work, but. The variance formulas for the OLS estimators are not valid because, again, the variance of these error terms is not constant uh, across different x. And therefore, the tests, um, the t-test and the f-test are also not valid. Uh, and finally, the OLS estimator would not be the best linear unbiased estimator. There may be more efficient uh, linear estimators. So because of these last four uh, problems that happen when, the, um, when we have heteroskedasticity, we need to first test for heteroskedasticity and then offer solutions to correct for this heteroskedasticity because otherwise we would not have valid t-tests and f-tests and our conclusions would not be valid. So how would we test for heteroskedasticity? So here's the hypothesis testing that we're going to be do, doing. The null hypothesis H0 would be that the variance of u given x is equal to sigma squared. That was the homoskedasticity assumption that we talked about. And HA, the alternative hypothesis, is that the variance of u given the x does not equal sigma squared, so we have heteroskedasticity. So we typically have all of the significance going in the alternative hypothesis and all of the unequal sign in the alternative hypothesis. So this is when we see heteroskedasticity. So if we conduct a test and we find homoskedasticity, then there is no problem and we could use the test as is. And if we find heteroskedasticity, we would need to make corrections. So let's review this property of the variance. So the variance of u given x is actually equal to, using the properties of a variance, to the expected value of uh, u squared minus the expected value of u squared. So this is again a property of the variance. And because here this term is expected value of u given x, well, under assumption four of the zero conditional mean, we have that actually this term would be equal to zero. So this is why we have the variance of u given x is the expected value of u squared given x. So we, we would now concentrate on this expected value of u squared instead of the variance. So that would mean that the null hypothesis is that the expected value of u squared does not vary with the independent variables. That's the case of homoskedasticity. And the alternative would be that the expected value of u squared varies with the independent variables. So here exactly is how we're going to do the test. So we would get this expected value of u squared, and we want to see if that would vary with the independent variables or not. So here's the original regression model, y equals, and let's assume we have three independent variables. So we have x1, 
x2 and x3. Um, it could be any number of independent variables here. And um, we can estimate this model and get the residuals u hat from here and then square the residuals uh, u hat squared. So the Bruch Pagan test would be using the following regression. It would have the squared residuals u hat squared. And then we would put back in the x1, the x2, and the x3 here. These are the original variables. So under the null hypothesis, we do not want this um, regression to have any explanatory power. So what we would expect is to see insignificant coefficients here. And we also expect to see very low r squared because if it's low r squared, this means that the independent variables do not explain this dependent variable. So the white test would use the following regression. So it's similar to the Bruce Pagan test because it has the squared residual here. And then it also has x1, x2, and x3. But here we, it has different uh, quadratic terms. So it has the x1 squared, x2 squared, and x3 squared. And then it has the, all of the interactions of x1, x2, x1, and x3, and then x2 and x3. So here, not only that we want to see if the u squared does not depend on the x terms, but we also don't want them to depend on the square terms and on the interaction terms. So one advantage is that it's more flexible form. It includes more terms. But the disadvantage is uh, we have now nine terms, nine uh, coefficients here to test instead of only three. So uh, that, that would... Uh, uh, that would eat up degrees of freedom. And the final test here is the alternative white test. So here, instead of just taking the um, x, x variables, what we would do is you, we would put here y hat the predicted value and y hat squared the predicted or the fitted value squared. So these predicted values are coming from the original regression. So instead of just doing the x1, x2, and x3 here directly, we would be doing just the y hat, the fitted value. And so that would be the alternative y test. So if you, this is a side note, but if you remember the different regression specification tests and resets that we had when we didn't quite know the functional form and we were like experiencing experimenting with just the variables, then the variables squared and into interaction terms, and then we put the fitted values. This is kind of like similar to what we did there with the reset test, because we, again, we do not know what the form of this heteroskedasticity is, so we just uh, look up uh, different possibilities and we see um, uh, which one would work. So which one should you use in practice? People usually just stop with the Bruch pagan tests because if one if it shows heteroskedasticity you probably are done. But maybe if you don't get uh, if you get here you're on the borderline the conclusions as far as the p-value maybe you could try the y test and the alternative y test and see um, and see what what they would tell you if, if there is a homoskedasticity or heteroskedasticity. So again, you could use either one of these tests, the Bruch Pagan being the most um, commonly used, or you can use all all three all three of them. A final note that I have here is that just to notice that in this regression, the number of independent variables x1, x2, and x3 is three. In this regression, the number of independent variables is 9 because we have the three original variables, the three squared variables, and then the three interaction terms. So here at this k, the number of independent variables in this regression is 9. And here we have actually two independent variables. So k, the number of independent variables here, would be equal to 2, the y hat and y hat squared. So we would use this uh, on the next slide. So after the regression models for u hat are estimated, what we want to see is that all of these coefficients are jointly not significantly different from zero. That would be the case of homoscedasticity. And if at least if they're jointly significantly different from zero, then we would have the case of heteroscedasticity. So how would we test for it? We would uh, keep the r squared for the regression of u hat. So this is r squared, but 
this here is the u hat squared. So basically just telling me that's the r squared that came from the regression of u hat squared. But that is an r squared, the, the r squared that we are using. And so high r squared would mean heteroscedasticity here. And k would be the number of independent variables in the model in the model for u hat squared. So the way I talked about on the previous slide, this is the three, nine, and two independent variables that we had. So what is an F test for overall significance? We have seen this one before. The F stat would be equal to um, the R squared divided by K, the independent variables in the regression for u hat squared. And then uh, in the denominator, we would have one minus the R squared in the U hat squared regression divided by N minus K minus one. These are the degrees of freedom. Uh, so again, this is the F test, F -stat for overall significance of the regression. And we can also find this in any uh, common output, uh, in any regression output. Um, and again, no, if, the significant, if there is no significance in the coefficients, we would find homoscedasticity. If there is significance, we would find heteroscedasticity. The LM test um, is using the LM, the Lagrange multiplier statistic. And this one is N, which is the number of observations times the R squared again from this regression. And that would be distributed as a chi-square variable with K degrees of freedom, where this K is again, the number of independent variables. So, so again, we would have more significance if we have higher sample size or if we have um, higher R squared, we would again have more significance. And uh, if the p-value is greater than 0.05, we would have homoscedasticity. If the p-value is less than 0.05, uh, we would have heteroscedasticity. And again, we would only be doing corrections if we find heteroscedasticity. Otherwise, everything would work fine if we have the case of homoscedasticity. Okay, so if we do find heteroscedasticity with the previous test, what can we do? And the first solution that we're going to do is uh, the heteroscedasticity robust variance. Uh, so we could be using a robust standard errors. So let's review how we do this and what's the formula. So if we have the regression model with three independent variables here, we would estimate the regression model, get the residuals you had, and then uh, how would we find this variance uh, formula? How would we make the correction? Well, first we could regress X1 on all of the other variables. So here we would regress X1 on X2 and X3. What we would pick up from here is R1, uh, and these would be re the residuals R1 hat. And we can repeat the same process for X2 regressed on the other two independent variables, which is X1 and X3. And we could also um, regress the X3 variable on X2, X1 and X2. And so more generally, we would be getting the residuals R hat J. And these R hat J would be from the regression of XY, XJ, on all of the other independent variables. So again, we want to get the residuals r hat j of the uh, regressions of xj on all of the other independent variables. So if we pick up these residuals here, r, r hat ij, we square them and we take the summation of that. This is the sum of the squared residuals. So a heteroscedasticity robust variance formula would look like that. The variance of beta hat j, so here we have um, the coefficient with the xj variable. So if we're talking about the first variable, x1, that would be the beta 1 hat. And so what that would be equal to is we have here the summation of these squared residuals that we have here, um, r hat ij squared, and then multiply by u hat squared i. So multiplied by the individual residual. And then we in the denominator, we actually have the sum uh, 
of these squared residuals here, the Rij squared. Uh, and so here we would have the sum of the squared residuals, uh, and here we would have the sum of squared residuals, but also multiplied by u hat squared. These are the residuals from the original regression. And so again, because we have a variance, um, we have heteroscedasticity, and these residuals would actually be varying with the x variables. We would not have a simple formula for the variance, but it would look more complex like that. Um, so these are called the white huber eicher standard errors or the variance, and this formula would be valid only in large samples or asymptotically, and so our t-tests would be valid asymptotically or in large samples. And typically many of the software programs can calculate these robust standard errors very easily and there are canned procedures. Uh, but this is the variance formula that is being used. And again, we're only correcting for the variance of the coefficients, not the coefficients themselves. Here's another procedure that we can use uh, in order to correct for heteroscedasticity, and this is called the weighted uh, least squares procedure. And so we would distinguish between two forms of heteroscedasticity. The first case would be this one when the heteroscedasticity form is known. So we can use the WLS to estimate the model. And then the next case uh, in a couple of slides would be when the heteroscedasticity form is not known, uh, which is more commonly the case. So if the heteroscedasticity is known up to a multiplicative constant, Let's assume that this is the form of the heteroscedasticity. So we have the variance of u, error term, given x, the independent variable, so variance of u given x, equals sigma squared times h of x. So here we not only have sigma squared, uh, so it's not, you see how it's not constant anymore, but this h of x actually depends on x. So um, this is why we have heteroscedasticity here. So we can call this h of x h i, again, because it varies based on i, the, the observation. So here we assume that the variance is not constant, but is multiplicative, um, multiplicative uh, constant, so because it's multiplied by h i. So let's do a clever trick in order for us to actually establish homoscedasticity and be able to estimate the model. And this clever trick is if we multiply the errors ui by 1 divided by the square root of h, that will make actually these errors homoscedastic. Why? Well, let's look at it. If we have the variance of ui divided by the square root of h, what will happen because of the properties of the variance, if we get this term out of the variance formula, we would actually have to square it. So we would have 1 divided by h, uh, whereas within the variance is 1 um, divided by square root of h. So if we have 1 divided by h here, well, what we assume is that the variance of ui would actually be this term here, sigma squared hi. So this is what I've put here, sigma square hi. So we can cancel this term with this term, and what we see here is that this uh, variance actually sigma squared. So by dividing by dividing the square root the errors by the square root of hi, what we actually ensured is that we have uh, homoscedastic errors. Uh, so basically, um, we would not have any problems applying um, the ordinary least squares. So in order to do that, we would estimate the transform model where all of the variables and the constant are multiplied by 1 divided by the square root of h. So here, all of the variables are multiplied by 1 uh, divided by the square root of h, i. And the nice thing about this model now is that this error, as we have shown above, is actually homoscedastic because the variance of this error is sigma squared. And so I can just substitute this uh, yi divided by the square root of hi with 
uh, y i star. So basically, I'm calling this a uh, y uh, y i star. Here, I'm calling this uh, h zero star, h one star, and so forth. And here, that's my new error term. So if I transform the original variables by dividing them by the square root of h, then this model here using the start variables would be homoscedastic, and therefore we could just simply estimate it by OLS. Okay, but how would we estimate this model? So to estimate, this is the transform model that we saw on the previous slide where uh, we multiply each variable by one divided by the square root of h. So this model here would minimize the sum of the squared residuals. So the sum of the squared residuals here is the dependent variable minus, and then we have all of the independent variables times the coefficient. And you see how we are minimizing the sum of the squared residuals here, um, only that now we're doing it for the transform model. And so what we are finding here is that this square root of h here, um, because it's in parentheses and it's squared, if we take it out of the parentheses, we actually would have 1 divided by h. Not square root of h, but h, because now we're taking it out of this squared term. And so if you actually notice this term here, all of this expression is actually our original model. The original model is y um, that is equal to um, uh, y is equal to to um, uh, x1, x2, and, and all the way up to xk. Y is explained by these independent variables, and so that would be the same as estimating this model where we put it y equals to one divided by h. So what we have found here is that or less of the transform model multiplying the variables by 1 divided by the square root of h. So if we do this and multiply each variable by 1 divided by the square root of h, that would be the same as estimating our original model, which is this, with the weight of 1 divided by h. And so we would either multiply the variables by 1 times 1 divided by the square root of h, or we would use a weight of 1 divided by h. So notice which one has the square root and which one does not have the square root. So another point here to mention is that in the weighted least squares, this is what we are doing here, observations that have higher uh, error variance would have less weight. Why? Because if the weight is 1 divided by h here, the higher the variance here, that would make this weight on them smaller. Um, so this is the correction for heteroscedasticities. The I observation that has really high variance would actually get a lower weight in the estimation procedure. Whereas the OLS would give each observation equal weight. And finally, uh, let's talk about feasible generalized least squares. And this is when the heteroscedasticity form is not known. This is actually the most common case because in practice, we generally don't know the form of the heteroscedasticity. We just know that there is heteroscedasticity. So here we would be uh, transforming the variables again to get uh, homoscedasticity, but when we talked about this h before, this would be re re estimated as h hat, and we would be using this in the FGLS procedure. So let's suppose that we do not know the form of the heteroscedasticity. Um, so here is where um, the variance of u given x would be equal to sigma square h of x, but now we don't know this functional form here. And so even though we don't know it, let's assume that it's equal to the exponent of delta 0 plus delta 1 times x1 plus all the way uh, down to delta k times xk. 
So here, while we do not know the form, uh, we are assuming that it's a linear form uh, and then um, it, all of the independent variables are entering here. And we are also taking the exponent of that because we want that variance to be positive. So if we didn't have this exponent here, that expression may end up negative and that's not okay if we have variance. Variance needs to be zero or positive. So here um, we would estimate the regression model y uh, regressed on all of the independent variables. Uh, from this model, we would get the residuals u hat now we would calculate the log of u hat squared and we would estimate the regression model of log of u hat squared on all of these independent variables. So this looks like um, almost like the Bruce Pagan test, how we started for it, only that we don't have the u hat squared, but we have the log of that. Uh, and again, the reason for us taking the exponent and the logs is because we want to make sure that the variance that we estimate is positive. So now from this regression, we would get the fitted values. So the fitted values for log u hat squared uh, here would be g hat, if we call that g, g hat. And then we would take the exponent of g hat and we would call this h hat. So now um, we would have estimated this expression here as h hat. So although we don't know what this h is, like the case before, we could actually use an h hat instead. And so here we would be estimating the regression model using the weighted least squares with the weights equals uh, 1 divided by the, the h hat. All Alternatively, all the variables in the constant would get multiplied by 1 divided by the square root of h hat and the model would be estimated by OLS. So here you see exactly the same expression that we had before. Now this error is homoscedastic, so we could estimate the model by OLS. Uh, and the only difference that we see here as compared to the previous model is that here we have h hat, uh, which is estimated as well, as opposed to the h uh, that we had um, that we had before. So again, here is if the case of the homoscedasticity is not known, uh, we are assuming a generic form and we would estimate it and use this uh, instead. Okay, so this was the theoretical part. So now let me give you examples of how we would do this in practice. So here's the example of house prices that are measured in thousands of dollars and they're explained by lot size, which is the size of the lot in square feet of the house. Uh, then the um, square footage of the house, and this would be the size of the house in square feet. And then bedrooms would be the number of bedrooms. And so this would be the model that we would be estimating. Price regressed on lot size, square feet, and bedrooms. And we would also explore an alternative dependent variable, which is L price, the log of the house price. And we would be doing heteroscedasticity tests both for the price and then for the log price. So here our regression model would be price regressed on lot size, square footage, and bedrooms. And so we would again be estimating these coefficients. So from here, we would be getting the residuals u hat, and then we would square them to get the u hat squared. So let's apply the Bruce Pagan test for that. And here we would have u hat squared. So these are again, these squared residuals coming from here. And we would have uh, regressed on lot size, square footage, and bedrooms. So this for the Bruce Pagan test. For the white test, we have the same thing up to here, but then we would be adding the square terms of each of the independent variables, the interaction terms. Uh, and so now we would be having nine variables here. So here we had three variables. Here we have nine variables. And in the last one, the alternative Y test, uh, it, instead of the variables themselves, it could use um, the price hat and price hat squared. So this price hat 
uh, is the fitted value or the predicted value from this original regression. So it does not use the variables here, but it uses the fitted value uh, in here and the fitted value squared. Um, so again, this this these kind of look like almost like regression specification tests because we again don't know the form of the functional form of the heteroskedasticity, and we're just trying as many possible. Um, uh, specifications for it to see if we can detect any heteroskedasticity. So again, the goal here is the null hypothesis is to find homoskedasticity. This means that these variables, uh, these coefficients would not be jointly significant or the R squared would be very, very low. Um, so basically the independent variables will not be explaining the squared uh, residuals. So after regression uh, models, then you had squared are estimated. And again, the null hypothesis would be that these delta coefficients, notice these are not the original beta coefficients in the regression model. These are the delta coefficients that are coming from the model of u hat squared. Um, so these are, these are not significantly different from zero. And here we would have the case that they're jointly significantly different from zero for heteroskedasticity. So we would estimate this regression model of u hat squared. We would keep the r squared, uh, and that would be the r squared for the regression of u hat squared. And so high r squared would mean heteroskedasticity, or if we have, again, joint significance of these coefficients, that would again mean heteroskedasticity. So the F test for the overall significance, here's the F stat, again, R squared from this regression of the U hat squared divided by K, and then we would have one minus R squared divided by N minus K minus one. So these are the degrees of freedom in the numerator and the denominator, and this will be distributed again as, a, an, as an F, uh, F um, uh, variable with, K degrees of freedom in the denominator and K minus N minus K minus one in the denominator. So the Lagrange multiplier test and the LM statistic would be equal to N times R square from this regression. And that would again be distributed as chi square with uh, K uh, degrees of freedom. And again, P value of greater than 0.05, homoskedasticity, and if it's less than 0.05, we would have heteroskedasticity. So let's go ahead and do these tests. Um, first of all, we would be looking at graphs of re residuals against, uh, I picked one independent variable. So here, what we have on this uh, graph is that's the residuals for the model uh, for price. So here price was regressed on all of the three independent variables. And here the residuals, you see like the residuals here are plotted against the size of the house in square feet. So the square feet variable. So that's what we have here. For this model, uh, that was the model for log of price. So here the log of price was regressed on the three independent variables and the residuals here you see are plotted against the square footage variable. And so if we look at this, I mean, this one seems to have a wider distribution for the errors, uh, for the residuals. This one seems to be more tight. And again, for the heteroskedasticity, we want uh, a variance that's not constant. And so maybe you could argue that this one is not constant because maybe it's higher here for the higher values whereas it's more, um, more, more within the bands here for the lower value of the square feet. Whereas here it's more like, um, more, more like within a band, more like constant. But again, it's very, very difficult to tell from a graphical representation. Uh, that's why we need to do formalized tests uh, because it's kind of difficult to see it graphically. In this graph here, it shows again the residuals for the model on price and here for the model of log of price, whereas here, uh, these are again residuals as on the previous slide, but what we have here, this is the fitted values from the previous regression. So this is the price hat as far as fitted value and this is the uh, log of price hat 
And so again, here you see variance that maybe is not as constant. Um, and here you see much more of a constant variance, uh, constant variance. So again, I know the results from the formal tests, um, but it's kind of hard to tell from the graphs uh, whether this is not a constant variance, uh, whereas here we have constant variance, but that's what the case would be in the later slides. Okay, so now let's uh, estimate uh, the original model and then calculate the different um, uh, estimate the different uh, regressions for the heteroskedasticity tests and calculate the test statistics for that. So what we see here um, as the first model, this is the model for price, and here we have price regressed on lot size, square feet, and bedrooms, the number of bedrooms as independent variables. Um, so this is the original regression, this is the coefficients um, and we have, um, and you can see number of observations in R squared. So now from this original model here, we would be calculating U hat, the residuals, and then we would be squaring those residuals. So this U hat squared, these are the squared residuals from this model here. And so now that becomes the, in the dependent variable and the independent variables are again these three variables here. So that's what the Bruce Pagan test does. It, it's, it has U hat squared, the residual squared, regressed on the three independent variables here. For the Y test, we have the U hat squared regressed on the three independent variables, but then you have the squared terms and the interaction terms between them. And then for the alternative to Y test, we have the U hat squared, regressed on price hat, so this is this price hat coming from this regression. Uh, that is basically the fitted values from this regression, and then price hat squared uh, is this regression here. Okay, so now we have estimated these uh, regression models, and so again, the Bruce Pagan test, um, we have, for the Bruce Pagan test, we have the squared residuals regressed on the independent variables, the, if we regress them on the independent variables, their squares and interactions, that would be the Y test, and on the predicted values, that would be the alternative uh, Y test. So notice that here, several of the coefficients in the regression for U hat squares are individually significant. So we see that this coefficient here is significant using a t-test for individual coefficient significance. We have one coefficient here significant. And here we have two coefficients actually being significant. So we already have uh, some indication that some of the coefficients are significant here. But what we want is very low. Um, we do not want to have joint significance in all of these coefficients because if we find joint significance in all of the coefficients, we would find the case of heteroskedasticity. And then we are noticing here that the R square 0 0.16 and 0.38 and 0.18 uh, is a bit high. Uh, so the, we would be using these R square to calculate the test statistic. So, okay, so let's pick up the R square from here, the number of observations, and then conduct the tests on the next slide. So again, for these three tests, I picked up the number of observations and I also picked up the R squared from the previous slide. And the number of uh, independent variables here was three. And this is not the original regression. This is now for the U hat squared regressions. So here, because we had just the independent, the three independent variables, that, that's why it was the three degrees of freedom. Uh, or three independent variables. Here uh, for the Y test, we had the variables, the variables squared and the interaction terms. That's why we have nine. And here we had U hat and U hat, uh, I mean, sorry, we had Y hat and Y hat squared uh, or price hat and price hat squared. That's why we had two independent variables. So if we're looking, this is the F stat that I copied from the previous slide. So if we just substitute this, these terms in this formula, this is what we are going to find for the F stat. So we're picking up the R squared, which is this, divided by three, that's the K, and then one minus the R squared, and then divided by N, which is 88, minus three, which is this one, minus one, 
and that's the f stat. And same thing here, we have the r squared divided by n. These are the number of independent variables in the regression for u hat squared. And here we have divided by 1 minus the r squared n is this one, minus k is 9, minus 1, and so we have this as test statistic. So that's how we calculate the f statistic for all of these. And then the p-value for the f statistic would be this. Okay, again, we see that that p-value is very, very small. In fact, it's less than 0.05. And the LM statistic, the formula for that was n times r squared. So we have n is 88 times the r squared, which is this, 0.16. And that's the test statistic. And here is we have n times the r square, which is this number, and we have that number and so forth. So this is the Lagrange multiplier statistic. And the p-value that we calculated, again, is less than 0.05. So again, because of the p-value is less than 0.05 here, everywhere, we find the case of heteroscedasticity. So what we have found here is that the coefficients are jointly significant. This means uh, or the R square is high and it actually has explanatory power. So what we are finding is that the independent variables are actually explaining the squared residuals. And that's the case of heteroscedasticity because we don't want that to happen. Um, so if all tests are showing heteroscedasticity here in the price variable, what we need to do is we need to correct uh, for uh, the price. Um, we need to have a heteroscedasticity cor correction for it. Okay, so now let me show you exactly the same thing, uh, but this case we have the heteroscedasticity test, test for the log of price. So everything is exactly repeated except I have log price here. And these are the same independent variables. So here I'm noticing we have significant coefficients in the original model. That is fine. That's what we want. And then we're picking up the, the square residuals. I will call this y hat 1 squared from this regression just to distinguish those from the uh, squared residuals on the price uh, equation. So these are the squared residuals from this model in log price. And so we have, these are these coefficients. And then for the Y test, we have all of the independent variables, the squared, the interaction terms. So this is these regression results. And then here we have Y hat and Y hat squared. This is the log price uh, hat and log price um, hat squared. Uh, and so these are these regressions. So if you look actually at the significance of these coefficients, we only have one coefficient here being significant, but significant uh, using an individual t test. But we generally have less uh, individually significant uh, coefficients. We only have one, and we don't have several like it was the case before for the price. And if you actually look at the R squared from this regression, 0 0.04, 0 0.08, and 0 0.01, these are very, very low R squared. So just even looking from this table before we do the formal test, it looks like we don't have a lot of significance and it looks like the R square is actually very low. So we don't have regressions that are explaining a lot um, of the squared residuals. So maybe now we would find the case of Holmes consistency. So let's see on the next slide. So again, I have picked up uh, from the previous slide the number of observations, the R hat, um, the R squared. So again, these are for uh, heteroscedasticity tests for the log price, uh, not for the price, but for the log price. And so I will go over this quickly since I talked about it on the previous slides. So here again, we're using this F, st F stat um, formula. So we have here picking up the R squared from here divided by the three uh, independent variables, one minus the R squared, and then we have N minus K minus one. So this is the test statistics here. We have the P values for the F test. Uh, we have the L uh, LM statistic, which is the N times R square. So here we have N times R square, N times R square right here. And that's that value for the LM statistics. And then we have the P value for the LM test here. 
And so what we're looking at here is that we have the p-values, if you look at this here, the p-values are actually greater than 0.05. And because they're greater than 0.05, we actually have the case of homeschedasticity. So all tests are showing homeschedasticity in log price. So if we actually happen to estimate a regression model for log of price, that would not need corrections for heteroscedasticity. So only a model in price would need correction for heteroscedasticity because that's what we found two slides ago. Okay, so now let's go back to uh, the model for price and let's offer and let's do these corrections for heteroscedasticity. Now that we have established that price uh, the model for price it has heteroscedasticity in it. Let's go ahead and actually uh, do the corrections. So what we would do here is the first one is I estimate an OLS model where price is regressed on lot size, square feet, and number of bedrooms. And this is the model that is not corrected. Even though I know there's heteroscedasticity, I did not make any corrections for it. And here, uh, this is the OLS model with robust standard errors, with robust SE standard errors. And so uh, what we are finding here is that, look at the coefficients are identical. Why? Because when we're calculating robust standard errors, it's the standard errors that we are correcting. We're not correcting the coefficients. So here the standard errors are just a little bit different. You see like these standard errors are a little bit different and uh, this one, well, this one seemed to be uh, quite a bit more different. And this one seems to be more different uh, as far as standard error, but they're larger in magnitude as well. So again, we see some corrections in the standard errors, but uh, as far as the um, significance of the coefficients, we see that this coefficient actually became insignificant. Um, so again, but the change itself was small, but it, it was enough to make it uh, insignificant. And so using these robust standard errors is the easiest solution for heteroscedasticity. And a lot of uh, software, mo software uh, packages could calculate these robust standard errors uh, very easily. And in this case, even though, again, we had very small sample size, even though the model for price is heteroscedastic and we made the corrections, um, we, we see very little change um, even though this coefficient became uh, insignificant. Now notice that this is the model for price and the model for log of price has homoscedasticity so robust standard errors are not needed to be estimated. But you can estimate them and you could go ahead and estimate this in the software and see that again there won't be much difference at all because if it doesn't need correction for um, heteroscedasticity, the results wouldn't be very different. Okay, so now let's do the WLS, the weighted least squares. Uh, so what we have here is two regression uh, models here. The first one is the original model of price on lot size, square foot, and number of bedrooms. But here we're using the weights of one divided by the square footage. So here, for this case, let's assume that the heteroscedasticity form is known. And we're assuming that the variance of u given x is sigma squared times square feet. So I actually here have assumed that uh, that's, that's the known form of heteroscedasticity that somehow the variance of the error term is varying with square feet. So um, as, as you saw on the, um, on the graph a few slides ago, perhaps as square feet increases, maybe the variance also increases for this variable. So if we assume that to be the form of heteroscedasticity, what we need to do in order to make these um, errors homoscedastic is we need to use a weight of one divided by the square foot because that would actually make uh, these these errors homoscedastic. And so this is what this model actually is estimating here. In the second regression, what we are finding is that all of the variables would be multiplied by one divided by the square foot. Um, and the model would be estimated uh, by OLS. Uh, 
So here, this is the model that we're estimating price divided by the square root of square foot and then the constant is also divided by uh, this expression so we would have no constant in that model but this will be the constant instead and then uh, again we have each of the variable divided by the square uh, square root of the square foot and uh, the doing this transformation to the variables actually makes the model homoscedastic. So this is these variables here, lot size star, because now uh, we are calling this one the lot size star. The divide, if we have the original variable divided by the square, square root of the square footage and so forth. And the price star is because we divide the price by the square root of the square foot. And um, th these are the results that we have. So, um, so another thing to notice here is that um, we actually have identical results here. If you look at this, we would have exactly the same coefficients, exactly the same standard errors, exactly the same significance. So what we're showing here is that the results are identical. The only thing that's different is the R square is different because when we actually transform the variables, the sum of square total and so on uh, changes. So that's why the, the R squared is different are different. But other than that, the coefficients, the standard errors, and the um, significance is identical between the two models. So again, this is why many people, instead of just doing the transformation, they would just go ahead and estimate the original model with a weight because any software package could actually very easily uh, estimate this model uh, with a weight. So this is, this is what we find here. This is the W LS method. So we assume that we know the form of the heteroskedasticity and uh, if we know that that's sigma squared times the square footage, then this this weight of 1 divided by the square footage would be um, uh, would be the weight and that's how we would uh, calculate the weighted least squares. So the final model that we're going to be doing here is the feasible generalized least squares with weights versus the feasible generalized least squares after transformation. And so here's the case where the form of the heteroskedasticity is not known. So what we need to do is first estimate that form. And so what we would do here is we would estimate the original model um, and then we would do a few transformations, uh, estimate the model for uh, the log uh, of the u hat squares, uh, get the fitted values from that, uh, exponenti exponentiate them. And so this, that's how we find this h hat, hat from that, that procedure. Um, and so here the weight would be 1 divided by this um, h hat. And so using these weights, uh, this would be what we see here for the feasible generalized least squares. And another um, regression would be to multiply all the variables by 1 divided by the square root of h hat. And so here's what we found. Just like on the previous slide, uh, we would not be dividing by the square root of just the h i uh, and in that case was the square footage because that's what we uh, assume the form of heteroskedasticity. But here we would just do the more generic h hat. And so um, these would be the results here with the stars. So price divided by the square root of h hat would be the price star one. Uh, that's what this dependent and independent variables are. And if you notice again, these two procedures give you exactly the same coefficients, exactly the same standard errors, exactly the same significance. Again, the R square is different because the transformation created different um, sum squares total and so forth. Um, so, um, but again, the results are actually identical between these two models. So, again, most people would just use uh, the regression here with the weight of 1 divided by h hat because it's just easier.
Okay, so here's all of these three uh, methods that I talked about. So I put them here on the same slide. So here what we have is the OLS, the original model, uh, without any corrections, though we know we have heteroscedasticity. Here we have OLS with robust standard errors. So notice how these coefficients are the same, uh, but only the standard errors are different. Uh, and then for WLS, uh, here we had uh, assumed that the form of heteroscedasticity is known, and that was equal to sigma squared to the square footage, and that's what was the weight here. The weight was 1 divided by the square footage in this regression. And here for the feasible generalized least squares, we didn't know the functional form, so we needed to estimate it. And here again, the weights are 1 divided by the h hat, the one that we estimated. And so, as I said here, um, the um, robust standard errors do not change the coefficients, but they change the standard errors. What happened, we, we actually lost the significance of this coefficient. It just happened for this model that to be the case. But the coefficients would be different for the OLS and the WLS and feasible generalized the coefficients would be different for WLS and feasible generalized least squares because again we're using weights, uh, so so that would be um, that would be different. Um, if you notice, generally the coefficients, if you notice, if you notice, generally the coefficients are very very similar uh, across the models. Uh, maybe this one is just a little bit more different here. Um, but as far as significance of the coefficients, uh, these, these coefficients are significant just like with the OLS. So even though, again, we found heteroscedasticity, we corrected for it uh, using these three different approaches, we generally find similar results across all models after correcting for heteroscedasticity. So again, for your research project, uh, what you need to do is uh, uh, first test formally for heteroscedasticity. If you find heteroscedasticity, then at least you need to apply a robust standard errors or uh, possibly use WLS or FGLS uh, for it. But most commonly what we use is the robust standard errors to correct uh, for heteroscedasticity. So as a review uh, questions, um, I would uh, suggest that you go back, review everything, and try to define heteroscedasticity. Think when heteroscedasticity is present, are the coefficients biased? How about the variance of the coefficients? Is this correct? Are the t-tests and f-tests valid? Describe the three tests that are used for heteroscedasticity. Describe the procedures for each test, what's different between them. And then think about the two cases when the heteroscedasticity form is known, what procedure do we, we use and describe the WLS. And if the form is not known, then what procedure is used and describe the feasible generalized least squares. And why is it equivalent to multiply each variable by one divided by the square root of h, but the weight is h divided, uh, the weight is one divided by h. So that was it for heteroscedasticity. Thank you for watching.